AMD comes from a long line of low-end budget processes, not known for much other than being the cheapest of the cheap in terms of new hardware, alongside AMD's Athlon range. Often found in media centers, office PCs, or cheap laptops, these CPUs are not used to being pushed very hard, but today I'm going to test the limits of what a Celeron can do using this Celeron D360. Enjoy. Celeron doesn't exactly have the reputation for being a worthwhile product, but as mentioned before, it was never meant to do much other than be cheap and do basic tasks. The Celeron was introduced back in April 1998 and became cemented as Intel's answer to the low-end market, with the processors always being cheap and cut-down versions of their higher-end counterparts. Despite seeming incredibly mundane on the surface, the Celeron line will occasionally put out something completely unexpected. One prime example of this is the Celeron 300A. Known as an overclocking legend, it had far less L2 cache than the higher end Pentium 2s, but unlike its more expensive brother, the cache was located on the CPU die, meaning that it could be cooled easier while also running at the same clock speed as the processor. Back in 1998, the 300A was around $200, a hell of a lot cheaper than high end Pentium 2s but overclocking could bring the chip up to 450 MHz, meaning it could compete with Pentium 2s that cost up to $300 more. The furthest the 300A has been pushed is 721.2 MHz, a whole 240% more than its base clock of 300 MHz. The Celeron 300A will forever be remembered as an unexpected powerhouse for its time that defied all expectations and showed the potential of overclocking. The next significant Celeron came from, of all places, the Celeron D family, in particular the Celeron D356. Over the years, the CPU would set new records for overclocking, starting in around 2006 when it was able to hit 7.2239 GHz under liquid nitrogen. In 2011, the same CPU set new records for being the highest overclocked CPU, as hardware bot user Brian Wyatt was able to push it all the way up from its stock clock of 3.33 GHz to 8.2 GHz. The Celeron D352 was pushed even further, reaching 8.5437 GHz. And as of today, that's the highest the Celeron has ever been pushed on record. Celeron D360, released in 2006, is the second best center mill Celeron. I got mine for about $10 off Trade Me, and you can often find them for about the same price on eBay. With a single core clocked at 3.46 GHz and 512 kilobytes of L2 cache, I'm not expecting a lot out of it. For such a weak processor, it consumes a reasonable 65 watts, so this Intel stock cooler should be enough to keep it from getting too hot. The motherboard I'm using is a slightly more recent Intel board, which will be a good match for the Celeron, as well as 2GB of 667 MHz DDR2 RAM sent with the motherboard by Lemon. And just to make sure we are almost entirely CPU bound, I'll be testing with my GTX 960. With that all out of the way, time for the benchmarks. As the aging Intel stock cooler hummed away, I started up Cinebench R15, and after nearly 20 minutes it was finally finished. It scored a whole 37 CB, which in the Celeron's case counts for both single and multi-thread. In comparison, the Pentium 4 HT651 scored 41 CB for single thread, and 56 for multi-thread. The first game I tested was Trine 2, lowering the settings as low as they would go and the resolution to 720p. The frame rate didn't drop below 30 often but frame times were a bit all over the place with a bit of stutter. Overall, this game is fairly playable on a Celeron D, but at the sacrifice of it looking like a bit of a mess. Next, Portal. While playing at medium settings at 720p, the average frame rate might not appear that bad, but when looking through portals, there was a noticeable dip in performance that hurt the experience a lot. Despite this, frame times weren't too bad, and there wasn't any noticeable stutter. 
Despite disabling MSAA and keeping the game at 720p, Jet Set Radio couldn't quite hold a consistent 30fps, not helped by its awful frame times. Need for Speed Most Wanted didn't prove too much of a challenge for the Celeron, pulling 30 frames with the detail slider set to about 75%, and a resolution of 1280 by 960 Racing in the Gulf wasn't incredibly responsive, mostly due to the pretty high frame times, but I was able to win the race. The minimum requirements for Oblivion lists the 2GHz Pentium 4, so unsurprisingly, Oblivion didn't perform too bad on the Celeron. Settings did have to be dropped to 720p medium, where the Celeron managed a solid frame rate, only held down by very bumpy frame times. Initially, it seemed like newer indie titles were where the Celeron D shined, pulling a rock solid 60fps at 1080p in a not very demanding Stardew Valley, with slightly worse than average frame times. Everything from walking to mining ran with no issues, and overall the game was perfectly playable. Braving the depths in Bioshock at 720p medium with all the extra graphics options off yielded a stable enough 45fps with ok frame times. The game did look slightly lacking even compared to the Xbox 360 version. Blood and Bacon ran at 720p with no issues. The game held a consistent 60 for most of the time, only rarely dropping to 30. Frame times were actually not that bad, but it's not too surprising considering this game lists at 1.2GHz Pentium 4 as its minimum requirement. Hotline Miami proved that even modern indie titles could prove a bit too difficult for the Celeron, as it struggled to get over 30fps at 720p. To add to this, the frame times were very inconsistent, making the game pretty hard to play. The Celeron continued struggling, not even being able to hit 30fps and into the Gungeon, with the settings lowered to the minimum and the resolution to 720p. The frame times were way too high, with occasional moments where the game would freeze for a few seconds which guaranteed that it was absolutely unplayable. Finally, I tried out some N64 games using Project 64. After setting the resolution to 1024 by 768 and filtering to two times, Mario Kart 64 ran with no issues at all. Super Mario 64 was the same, holding a consistent 30 frames throughout my journey through bomb on Battlefield. The Celeron D is many things. It's an overclocking legend, an infamous processor known for being garbage. But the fact that it's so easy to bash is part of what makes it so interesting. Yes, most of the Celeron line is worse than most Pentium 4s, but that was what Intel intended. Really, the only reason to use the Celeron D in 2020 is just to see what it can do. How far it can be pushed. Just how limiting it really is. No matter what graphics card you pair with the Celeron D, it's gonna struggle to play some of the least demanding modern games. Almost any other processor would be a better choice no matter the build. Not even the processor's power efficiency can make up for its lackluster performance with its TDP of 65 watts. And that is the Celeron D. Thanks for watching. Hi, before the video ends, I have to uh, thank a couple people who helped me work on this video. First of all, a couple people from Obsoletus Discord, uh, Rio for a couple game suggestions, and of course, Lemon for shipping the motherboard and RAM down. That was a massive help, thanks so much for that. Rowan for helping with the title card and thumbnail, and Corey for picking games to benchmark giving general feedback on the final edit of the video, helping me research the Celeron, helping me organize the benchmarks, helping me basically put together the video in terms of sections and what to talk about, also script editing. That's about it. I'm not sure when the next video will be, it might be a while, but you can vote in the poll for what you want to see next. Alright, bye.